In this video, I'm going to go through my own unofficial work solutions to the 2023 British Physics Olympiad Senior Physics Challenge paper. Um, I thought there are some really nice questions here. If you want to download my own work solutions, there's a link underneath the video. Um, but yeah, let's get uh, started. So uh, the first few questions were multiple choice. Um, the first one, uh, we've got a car tire. Um, so as the car is driving along, it might last for 40,000 kilometers. Um, how many rotations does it make? Well, um, I estimated that the diameter of a car tire is about 0 0.6 of a metre. Um, but, you know, it's going to be maybe between 0 0.5 and 0 0.7. Um, the circumference is going to be pi d, uh, which is about 1.88 metres. Um, and I said if s is the total distance it's travelled, uh, divided by the circumference, so that's 40,000 times 10 to the 3 metres, divided by about 1.88 metres. Uh, this means it rotates about 2.1 times 10 to the 7 times. So for this, um, we're looking at the kind of the order of magnitude, 10 to the 7 is an approximate value. So that one there, a bit of common sense, just trying to, I suppose, think about a real car tyre and roughly uh, what the diameter is. The second one, uh, when I first saw it, it kind of, it really got me thinking because we've got this kind of strangely shaped vessel. However, there is an equation that you should remember from when you did GCSE physics about how the pressure at a depth depends on the density of the fluid, which in this case is constant, the gravitational field strength, which in this case is constant, and the height of uh, the fluid above it. Um, actually, it doesn't really matter about the shape. So here, uh, the pressure is proportional to the height, and therefore, um, or the, the depth of, flu of uh, a fluid, and therefore pressure being proportional to depth is A. So A is the correct answer for that one. For the third question, we have a sound wave and we want to look at how much um, it's out of phase where it's received to compared to where it's sent. So the first thing I did was I worked out the wavelength just using the wave speed equation, uh, which comes out nicely as exactly two meters. Now, I said that S was maybe the total distance, in this case, 157 meters. Um, and that's gonna be equal to some integer times the wavelength plus uh, I've put uh, delta lambda to be the extra distance of wavelength. Now, um, when n is 78, uh, 78 times 2 is 156. So basically, 157 metres is equal to 156 metres of complete wavelengths plus this extra distance here. And that means the extra distance is 1 metre. Uh, so basically, that's going to be half a wavelength. And half a wavelength... Well, if one wavelength is 360 degrees, half a wavelength is just 180 degrees, uh, and therefore it's 180 degrees of a wave cycle. So that's why the answer was E for that one. Uh, the next one, um, I quite like this question. I think it's, it's a kind of nice CVAC question. Um, so a girl standing on a cliff throws two balls, one up and one down at the same speed. How do the final velocities of each compare as they hit the sea? So um, there's not really much space here, so I'm just going to sort of have my kind of diagram underneath. Now, in the first scenario, if we think about the ball which is going down, I've called that ball one. Effectively, um, in the vertical direction, its initial velocity is u1. And then uh, as it uh, goes down, it's going to kind of speed up until it kind of hits the sea um, at uh, its kind of sort of final velocity. So I'm going to call that v1. OK, now the second ball, it's been thrown up into the air at a speed of u2. Uh, I'm going to call that u2 because I'm, this is like the second ball, so ball two. And basically it's going to go up, it's going to come back down, it's going to pass through this position, and then it's going to keep going. Now, if we just think about the motion as the ball goes from here up to the top point and back down again, if I just write down suvat... Um, in the vertical distance, the total vertical displacement when it gets back to its original starting point, s is equal to zero. Going upwards, it's got an initial vertical velocity of u2. We don't know the final vertical velocity as it goes up to that point and then it comes back down through here. Um, and we know the acceleration, um, let's say upwards is positive then downwards the acceleration is going to be equal to minus g. So if we wanted to find the value of v, we can say that v squared equals u squared plus 2as. 
Um, of course, it doesn't really matter what a is because s is zero, so that all goes to zero. Uh, and that means that v squared is going to be equal to u squared, and the initial vertical velocity was u2. And I'm going to call this uh, vertical velocity as it's coming back down here. I'm going to call that v2. And therefore, uh, v2 squared is equal to u2 squared, so therefore v2 is equal to u2 when we take the square root of both sides. Of course, um, if it was initially going up, it's going to be coming down now. So basically, v2 is going to be equal to the, the negative square root of that, um, minus u2. And if we think about what the modulus is, because we're just looking at the speed, uh, v2 is equal to u2. So just as fast as it is thrown up, it's going to be moving down at exactly the same speed as it goes through that same point. And then uh, it's going to keep accelerating uh, until it gets to, I'm going to call this v3. So u1 and v2 are the same magnitude of speed, and that means v1 and v3, the final speed of the impact of the ocean, is going to be the same. A lot of stuff there, but uh, basically it's going to be the same. Okay, you didn't have to show any of this working out. Um, but effectively, if you throw something up into the air at 5 metres per second, it will come back down at 5 metres per second at the point it was launched from. Okay, um, those were the multiple choice questions. Um, I thought they were okay. Uh, the next one, uh, again, there's lots of information here, and I'm assuming by this point you'll have had a go at the questions, and this is kind of just you working through uh, the solutions, having had a go at the questions already. Uh, but effectively what we've got is a, a long uniform straight rod, a smooth horizontal surface, and it's basically spinning around as it goes across the page. Now the tip at the top is going at 2.6, the one at the bottom is going quicker, and that means um, effectively it's doing something like this as it goes across. So the first diagram I drew here, um, I put a couple of bits of extra information on. I showed basically the direction it's moving in, um, and also that it's kind of rotating like this, so it's rotating clockwise. Um, and the, the main thing is that the centre of mass of this is going to be moving along the centre line. And I just labelled the diagrams here to show the kind of progression. So um, that's the kind of diagram that we'd expect to see. For the second part, at what speed would you need to fly over the rod as an observer to see only its rotational motion? So effectively, um, we see the rod doing this across the table, but if I try to do something clever with the camera, um, if we were to move above it, what we'd see is that it only appears to be rotating. Okay, now, um, what I did was I looked at the average speed of uh, the two bits at the end. So basically, one is going at 2.6, one is going at 4.2, the average of those is 3.4, and then, effectively, that means... Um, if we think about the rotational speed at the tip, it's going to be 3.4 metres per second, but it's also going at 0 0.8. Because at the bottom, if we think about what's going on here, is it's going at 3.4, we add a number to make it 4.2. So 4.2, take away 3.4 is 0 0.8. And of course, at this end over here, we've got kind of a couple of vectors. We'd have uh, 3.4 in this direction, we'd have 0 0.8 in that direction, and that's why this tip, the vector, some of its um, translational and rotational velocities is 2.6. So it's going at 0 0.8 meters per second as it goes across that page. What frequency does it rotate at? Um, well, basically, um, the speed of the tip of its rotation is equal to the distance it travels, which is pi d, in the time period for one oscillation. So we can say that the time period is equal to pi d over v. But of course, frequency is one divided by time period. So therefore, if I kind of um, do one divided by t, that's the same as v over pi d. So one over t, the frequency is v over pi d. Uh, we worked out the tip of um, the tip speed is 3.4 up here. We're going to divide that by pi times uh, the diameter of that rod. Uh, and therefore that's equal to 3.183, so about 3.2 hertz. Uh, the next bit then. Um, if we observe the rod a quarter of a rotation later, what is the magnitude of the velocity at one of its ends? So here at the top we had uh, my kind of velocity diagram. Uh, the middle's going at 0 0.8, um, each tip is going at 3.4. 
When it's gone through a quarter of a rotation, I've then drawn my diagram here to show how the centre is still going this way at 0 0.8, but the tip is going up at 3.4 and that one's going down at 3.4. So this tip, the magnitude of its um, velocity, well, we've got basically a right angle triangle here. And if we think about this point here, there's both a um, horizontal kind of vertical component of velocity. So we've got 0 0.8 to 3.4, and then just using Pythagoras, uh, v is going to be equal to the square root of this squared plus this squared, which is 3.5 meters per second. Okay, and that's going to be uh, the velocity of either this end or this end down here, because I guess we could look at the same down here. Uh, we'd have 3.4 down, 0 0.8 across, and then we'd have exactly the same magnitude of its speed. So uh, that was um, that first part of the question five, um, looking at the rotation of this object. So the second part of part five is again looking at mass, but here we have a cable. So this is a cable here uh, just hanging freely at the moment. Where is the centre of mass? Well, on the diagram, basically what I thought about was if this is the, the bottom of the, of the cable here, if I did uh, maybe kind of straight line up to A, and then about halfway along that line, I kind of drew a line over to where the cable is. I basically thought at this point here, we've got about half the cable above that point and half the cable below it. So the centre of mass is going to be in line with this point over here. So I kind of just drew like a construction line across, put a circle there and label that X. So that's where the centre of mass is, where effectively we've got half the mass of that cable below that point and half the mass above it. Hopefully that makes sense so far. The second part, I thought was a brilliant question because it's something I'd never actually really considered before. So as I apply a force here and I straighten out the cable, you almost think, well, a cable's being pulled lower. Well, part of the cable is lower, but actually some of the cable above actually moves upwards if we think about what's going on near the tip of that cable. Now, what we've done is we've applied a force over a distance. Uh, on the diagram here, um, Effectively, this is where the cable was initially, and we've applied this force over this distance, S. Okay, now when you apply a force over a distance, we're doing work on that object, and that means energy has been transferred to it. Now at the end, when that force is applied, the, uh, the, the whole system is still static. So that means the increase in energy store of this must be in the gravitational potential energy store. And that's what I've put here. So basically, um, work is done by a force over a distance, so energy is transferred to the cable and its gravitational potential increases. And that means the centre of mass increases. That's because uh, if we think about what's actually happening here, um, the centre of mass moves up by a distance delta x and the gravitational potential store, EP, is going to be equal to uh, the mass that moves up times the gravitational field strength, in this case times delta x. Okay, in actual fact, if you look at the diagram, if we think about a line from here to here, halfway along that line is about here, which is why I've got this dotted line here. So effectively along this dotted line, we've got half the cable above it and half the cable underneath it. And if we compare this dotted line here to the one that's in line with the original centre of mass over there, we can see that this has actually moved up by a very, very small distance, delta x. So though the bottom moves down by s, the, the centre line moves up by a distance of delta x, and that's due to the increase in gravitational potential energy store when the work is done and the force has been applied to this. So we can see here that although the cable straightens out, um, we move some of the cable at the bottom down, but a lot of the cable up here actually moves upwards. I thought that was a really, really nice question. It really, really did get me thinking. Okay, so that was the end of question five. Um, we've now got, again, I thought this was a really kind of initially quite a straightforward kind of scenario um, where we've got something which is moving down onto uh, a kind of a wedge shaped. Obviously, um, you know me, I tend to like to make stuff out of Lego. So basically, this is my Lego scenario of what's happening. So we can see how as the red thing moves down, uh, this actually moves the, the wedge across to the left, across to the right whichever way we look at it. So, um, so it says uh, the, weight, the, the weight of the rod, I find that difficult to say, the, 
the rate, the weight of the rod is constant. The force acting on the smooth slope of the wedge is constant. What significant conclusion can be made about the type of motion of the rod and the motion of the wedge as a result? Well, basically, uh, it's Newton's second law, F equals ma. Now, the resultant force on this thing which is moving down, there's going to be uh, a weight acting down, which is constant, and the size of the frictional force, which is opposing that, is going to be constant as well. And the mass of this, and of course the mass of this, the mass of everything is staying constant. So that means, if everything is staying constant, we must have, in this case, a uniform acceleration. So this is going to accelerate down uniformly, uh, and that means this is going to accelerate uniformly as well. As that one comes down, this moves across. So, um, and obviously that's constrained as we have up here. As the wedge slides to the right at speed v, the rod slides down at speed u. Uh, copy figure five, so this one over here. Uh, I basically kind of copied it. Um, I did it in like a green kind of dashed line to show the original position, which is like this, okay? And then a short time later, delta t, um, this will have moved down vertically and that will have moved to the right, which is what I've drawn in purple over here. Okay, um, now the distance it moves down vertically, um, you know, speed equals distance over time, that vertical distance down is going to be equal to u delta t, because u is the, the velocity at that, uh, over that instant um, that it's going at. Horizontally, it's moved v delta t in the, the horizontal distance over here. So we now have a right angle triangle. Uh, we can see we've got a z angle in here, so that's theta, or that's theta as well, if we just kind of think about taking that triangle and kind of flipping it across. Um, so uh, that length is v delta t, that length is u delta t, uh, and theta, well, tan theta is opposite over adjacent, um, u delta t over v delta t, these cancel to say that tan theta equals u over v. Okay, so that relates u, v, and the angle of the slope, theta. Okay, and now this is kind of where the fun uh, really begins. Um, this is kind of the kind of the proper maths, and it, again, it kind of takes a while to work through this. I guarantee, though, if you're doing stuff like this, when you go back to doing past paper questions uh, and real exams, they're going to seem really easy. So, if the rod falls through height h, and the rod and the slope reach speeds u and v, respectively, write down an energy equation for the system in terms of m1, m2, u, v, g, and h. So, effectively, initially, all of the energy store is in the gravitational potential store of this. A short time later, um, just as much as its gravitational store has decreased, that's been transferred to this kinetic store plus that kinetic store. So basically, uh, we've got m1gh, the initial potential energy stored uh, in the rod at height, is going to equal a half m1u squared plus a half m2v squared. Uh, so that's basically the, the kinetic energies of those two things. We then had to obtain an expression for the speed of the wedge v in terms of m1, m2, g, h, and theta. Um, so from part uh, b over here, uh, we know that tan theta equals u over v, so u must be equal to v tan theta. Um, I then basically took this equation, so we've got m1 gh, the initial potential energy, is equal to a half m1 u squared, but of course u is v tan theta, so u squared is equal to v squared tan theta squared, or uh, yeah, tan theta squared, uh, plus a half m2 v2. Uh, I then multiplied both sides by two, and then I basically took out the v squared term of all of this to say that uh, 2m1gh is equal to v squared. And then you've got this times v squared plus that times v squared. And then I rearranged it to make v the subject. So I basically divided both sides by what's in the bracket. So I took that under here and I square rooted both sides to say that v is equal to 2m1gh over m1 tan theta tan squared theta plus m2, all square rooted. Okay, hopefully um, my writing is a bit clearer than the way I just explained that. But there's a lot of terms here. So that's how we can work at the value of v. For part e, um, m1 is m2 and theta is 30 degrees. 
And we want to know what fraction of the GP lost by the rod, this energy up here, is gained by the wedge, which is this bit over here. So this is kind of what we start with. This is what we have at the end. Now, the first thing I needed to do was to work out V squared. Now, of course, we know what V is here. Um, so basically, V squared is just going to be all of the stuff in this bracket. But of course, M1 is equal to M2. And therefore, we've got this M cancelling with this one and this one. Uh, and we can therefore say that 2GH is equal to a third plus one. And the reason it's a third um, is that basically all I did was I worked out tan of 30 degrees. And then I squared that on my calculator. I know that if you're doing maths, you should know this. And that's just equal to a third. So that's where this number over here comes from. Now, of course, you then got 2GH over 1 plus a third. So that's 2GH over 4 over 3, uh, which is then 3 over 2GH. OK, so um, the initial energy of the rod is equal to M1GH. So that's just MGH. And then over here, um, the kinetic energy of the wedge is a half M2V squared. So that's just a half MV squared, but V squared is 3 over 2GH. So you've got a half times 3 over 2, which is therefore 3 over 4 MGH. OK, so effectively, that's the initial energy stored in the rod. And that's the final energy stored in the kinetic energy of that moving wedge. So it went from effectively 1 to 3 quarters, and therefore that's 75% of the original energy um, goes to that wedge. Now for part F, uh, from this write down an expression for the speed of the rod u. So basically from this thing over here, I assumed that m1 is equal to m2, which is m, and theta is equal to 30 degrees. So this is the equation we have. Effectively mgh is a half mu squared plus 3 quarters mgh, which is what we had over here. So basically this is the kinetic energy of the rod. I put it in over here, and of course the m's cancel. That means, uh, and again, what I then did was I multiplied both sides by 2 to say that 2gh equals u squared plus 3 over 2gh. And uh, to make u squared the subject, I just took 3 over 2gh from both sides to say that u squared is equal to gh over 2. We then went back to some SUVAT, and in the vertical uh, direction, um, this goes through a height of h. It starts initially at 0 until it accelerates to its final velocity of u. Um, we don't know the acceleration and we don't know the time. But basically, um, v squared equals u squared plus 2as. So u squared, and here, a bit confusingly, u, and I did this in different colours to sort of show that, uh, the final velocity is u squared. Um, its initial velocity is zero, and therefore we've got 2as or 2ah. Uh, u squared, we know that from over here, is gh over 2. So gh over 2 is 2ah. Uh, the h is cancel. Uh, we can bring that 2 down here to say that the acceleration is equal to g over 4 in the case where theta is 30 and m1 is equal to m2. OK, so um, quite involved, and I think the, the mark scheme had a more complicated thing that was true for all angles of theta and different masses. But I see this um, as basically an extension of uh, the values from part E. OK, so basically, uh, as that goes down, that accelerates to the right. OK, um, I think that that was the end of question six. Question seven is about a caterpillar track um, on a vehicle which is moving along. Um, if we have somebody here, uh, what speed do they see a piece of mud on the top of the track move at relative to them? So uh, the way I did this was um, if we think about one of the wheels, it's a bit like the wheel on a car. So here's maybe a car wheel. Now, although that might be moving um, with its own sort of tangential velocity, the whole thing is moving along as well. And actually the bottom of the tyre isn't moving relative to the road. So if the tangential velocity V um, is going this way at the top and it's going that way at the bottom, the whole thing is also moving translationally at V as well. So at the bottom, the two cancel out and there's no relative motion. At the top, 
we've got the tangential speed of the wheel rim, plus we've got the translational speed of that wheel. So we've got V and V. So basically at the top it's going twice as fast as it is moving along, and at the bottom it's stationary. Hopefully that makes sense. So, um, to work out the speed, well we know that um, the distance travelled in one time period is going to be equal to pi d, so pi times 1.0, uh, divided by the time period gives a speed of 3.74 metres per second. So the bulldozer is moving at 3.75 metres per second past this person, but the speed at the top is going to be twice that. If we look at the kind of the difference between the motion of this red bit on the rim and uh, maybe this red bit here, which shows the the speed of the, the Caterpillar vehicle itself. Uh, we basically take that number, we double it to get a value of 7.5 metres per second. Hopefully that's, uh, that's kind of clear enough. The next one I thought was a really lovely question, um, and it messed with my head a bit, but this is what I did. Uh, so I drew a nice large circle with my protractor that I always have. Um, we then have something which is 2L, and um, also I marked on that the radius is 2L as well. So um, that's 2L, that's L, and that's L. That touches the rim, so does that, and so does that. Now, I then started marking some things on. So I drew my radius, which is 2L, and also that radius from the central point to here is going to be 2L as well. Now, if we then think about just this half of what we have, um, it's going to basically be equal on this side and this side. So we've got 2L, L, and 2L and L. Now, these bits are going to meet this at a tangent, uh, which is going to be at 90 degrees to the, the radius. Um, and I, I kind of just drew a line down the middle, and I just kind of labelled this angle in here as theta. Now, I took this triangle, redrew it over here. So we've got 2L, the radius. We've got L, the, rad the, the length of one of those beams, and this angle is theta. Um, we know, of course, that tan theta is opposite over adjacent, so 2L over L, which is just 2. So therefore, theta is going to be 63.42 degrees. But we want to know this whole angle here between AB and BC, which is going to be 2 theta. So I just doubled that number to make it 127 degrees. The actual maths was easy. The hard bit was trying to imagine what this might look like. So again, uh, I did like a kind of sketch diagram and then I kind of drew my neater one over here, making sure it's nice and big. And then it's a case of just recognizing where we have some nice simple triangles. Um, yeah, so I thought question eight was, was really lovely. For question nine, we had a question looking at internal resistance and in EMF. Um, I often forget what the equations are for this, so I always just double check. And when you're doing this Olympiad paper, you can use a data book. So uh, this is just an OCR one, but you can use whichever one you're familiar with. Uh, there's a couple of equations here which you might find useful. Also, make sure you still draw a diagram. So this is my cell that's got some internal resistance. Um, it's got an EMF of, let's say, E. Uh, the terminal PD um, is kind of effectively either across this resistor or measured across that. It doesn't really matter where in a circuit. And we've got a current of I. So uh, basically, um, the terminal voltage of a DC supply is 5 when it's open. And therefore, this value here is going to be my EMF of that uh, circuit. Um, when the 2 ohm resistor is connected, the voltage drops by 0 0.1. And that means now the terminal PD that we're measuring is uh, 4.90 volts. Okay, and the resistance R is 2.00 ohms. Now, effectively, because we've got a series circuit, we're going to have the same current everywhere. So we've got the current I through here. We'd have that same current I uh, going through that cell as well. Uh, and therefore, because I is equal to V over R, so we've got the terminal uh, PD divided by the external resistance, and that's going to be the same as the voltage drop over the internal resistance. So it's EMF minus the uh, 4.9 over here. So effectively, it's 0 0.100 volts dropped across that internal resistance. Uh, and therefore, we can just equate this and this. And when you do that, um, we find that R is equal to 0 0.0408 ohms. So that is the internal resistance which stays fixed. We're going to assume it's a fixed internal resistance in this. We then have the load resistor reduced to 0 0.400 ohms. What would be the terminal voltage now? 
Well, we'd still have the same EMF of 5 volts. We have an internal resistance R of 0 0.0408, and we know the external resistance of that circuit is 0 0.4, but we don't know the value of V. But again, of course, we know that uh, I is equal to V over R, like we had up here. And that's equal to the EMF dropped or over the, the total resistance of that circuit. So that's going to be equal to R here plus R. So uh, using this thing over here, we want to find the value of V. So we basically bring R up to here to say that V is equal to the external resistance times EMF over the total resistance of that circuit, which then gives a value of 4.54 volts. OK, um, actually, that wasn't too bad. I quite like that first bit. Um, but again, it comes from drawing a, a clear diagram, labelling what you know, and then finding an equation you can use, and therefore just finding the other unknown. The second part, though, I couldn't do. OK, now, I'm sure if you're watching this video, uh, you might have found this a bit tricky. If you found a way to do this, please let me know in the comments beneath this video. Uh, and I can then obviously update the work solutions I have. But I found this really tricky, not so much for some of the physics. I mean, um, you know, I, I could work out the current going through this and I could work out the current going through that. But I found that the question was a little bit unclear about which device um, it meant when it's talking about this constant current device. So I must admit that one there, I didn't find the question that clear and therefore I don't have a good solution at the moment in this video. Sorry about that. But uh, it does get tricky. The next one, though, um, was about balloons. And I really like this question. Now, you might notice that when you have a balloon, the first time you try and blow it up, it's really difficult. But if you blow it up several times, each time you blow it up, it gets a bit easier. And actually, sometimes what a lot of people do is you kind of basically pull the balloon before you inflate it. Now, effectively, this graph here, this says that basically the first time you want to kind of um, basically uh, extend it, it kind of, it takes a pressure like that. But the next time, it maybe doesn't go up quite as high and then if we were to unpressurize it, it kind of does this kind of thing down here, which is a bit like the kind of hysteresis loop you get with rubber, where we've got like the kind of the loading and the unloading graphs. Um, but yeah, that's something which I thought was quite interesting. Well, to me it was. Okay, um, the first bit though, what are the dimensions of C in terms of M, kilogram and S? Well, basically over here, we've got a radius in metres divided by a radius in metres, and therefore the units of these kind of cancel with each other, uh, and that means we've effectively got everything in this bracket here is unitless. Okay, so this is all unitless. And therefore we can say that the pressure is equal to C over R naught squared R, or if we rearrange that, we can say that C is equal to the pressure or you know the change in pressure times r naught squared r. Okay, so pressure. Well, we measure pressure as the force divided by area. Force in its SI units or is or its base units is kilogram meter second to the minus two divided by the area of meter squared is kilogram meter to the minus one s to the minus two. Okay, so that's the the base units for pressure, which I've got up here. Then we've got the base units for r naught squared, which is going to be meters squared times the base units of R, which is metres. So effectively, what we've got over here is we've got a metre to the minus one and a metre, so they kind of cancel. And therefore, C would have the base units uh, of kilogram metre squared second to the minus two. Right, uh, for the next part of number 10, um, we've got uh, the pressure curve there, but we've got some weird units. Now, it says here the pressure is dyne per centimetre squared, and it's in 10 to the 4. Um, so, again, I must admit that I didn't really know what a dyne per centimetre squared was. So for this one, I actually looked it up. Um, and actually, a dyne is the force of one gram accelerated by one centimetre per second squared. Now, looking at the maximum value on the graph, this was about 2 times 10 to the 4. So that's 2 times 10 to the 4 
dynes per centimetre squared. So a dyne is one gram, so that's one times 10 to the minus three, by one centimetre, so that's one times 10 to the minus two, divided by centimetres squared, so that's 10 to the minus two squared. So we've got 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus two, so that's 10 to the minus five, divided by 10 to the minus four is 10 to the minus one, over here. And then we've got this value here, 2 times 10 to the 4 times 10 to the minus 1 is 2 times 10 to the 3 pascals, or 2,000 pascals. Okay, um, the next one is by taking two regions of the grass, graph, estimate the work done in blowing up the balloon to a radius of 6 centimetres. Uh, but of course from the equation work done is force times distance, we obtain work done is pressure times a change in volume. So we've got, um, on the graph here, we know the pressure because we can look at it on this axis, and the change in volume we can work out from the change in radius over here. So effectively from this first region in green, we've got the average pressure, which is about 1.8, and we've got our change in volume, which is going to be 4 thirds pi r cubed, but we've got the final volume minus the initial volume, so we've got 4 centimetres cubed minus 2 centimetres cubed, which gives this first area as about 0.8. 4.2 and then the second area for this part over here where we've got an average pressure of about 1.3 uh, on this part here is going to be equal to 0 0.82. Now that's not actually the area on the graph. We can see that this green area looks bigger than the purple area but effectively um, because we've got a bigger radius that means r cubed is going to be much bigger uh, and therefore that's about 0 0.83 giving a total of about 1.3 joules. Part D is a little bit tricky. Uh, the first thing I did uh, was I took equation one and I just multiplied out the brackets, uh, which gave me this thing over here. Um, now, of course, when we've got um, maximum pressure, then effectively um, the change in pressure of radius is gonna be zero because it's effectively the kind of the top point on that curve. So if we were to differentiate this, we would then find that that is equal to minus C R naught R squared, because effectively we had R to the minus one, and now we've got R to the minus two times minus one, which is minus C over R naught squared R squared. Um, and then we've effectively had um, R to the minus seven, so that becomes R to the minus eight uh, times minus 7, which therefore becomes plus 7, and that equals 0. So that's the maximum value when um, the rate of change in pressure with divided by the rate and change in radius is equal to 0. And of course we can now basically bring this over to here. We find that the C's cancel, the R0 squared down there cancel, and therefore 1 over R squared is equal to 7 R0 to the 6 over R to the 8, we can then multiply both sides by r to the 8, so we kind of basically bring this up over to here. And then r to the 8 over r squared is r to the 6, which is 7 r naught to the 6. And that means rp, the radius at maximum pressure, is equal to the sixth root of 7, is that how you say it, times r naught. Okay, um, hopefully that's making sense. Now, something else that, um, this is actually kind of quite tricky to do, but I did it with a couple of different coloured balloons. So Imagine uh, we've basically got a big balloon. At a relatively low pressure. And then we have a smaller balloon at higher pressure. Okay, this is where it gets tricky to set up. I'm just gonna hold it together with my knees. Okay, so um, I think a lot of people assume that with something like this, the big one will go into the small one and the small one should get bigger. But let's see what happens. Oh, actually, it, it did kind of work, didn't it? The small one actually got smaller and the air in there goes into the big one, which is kind of a bit counterintuitive. You think they're going to basically just equalise in size and pressure. Now, obviously at the moment in this, the pressure is the same there and there. Okay, so um, in this first case, we had the bigger balloon was at lower pressure, and then it became even bigger, and the pressure, I suppose, kind of dropped overall. Whereas the higher 
pressure, smaller balloon actually decreased in radius and the pressure went down. Okay, so uh, that was the kind of first scenario where this one wasn't inflated a huge amount. Um, and basically, uh, looking at the graph, we can see that this one comes to here and the large one um, basically effectively moves around the curve. So the radius decreases until at the final point, we can see that both of these, if I just draw a line across, are now at the same pressure. So that's a kind of sort of counterintuitive thing. You've got a big balloon and a small balloon and the really small balloon actually gets smaller and uh, the pressure equalizes like that. Okay, the last part, we had a slightly different scenario. Um, so now we've got the lower pressure balloon starts out with a smaller radius. What happens? Okay, so a little bit tricky to set up. I've kind of just blown it up, twisted it around. This is something you can try at home and I've just got a, a metal tube that's kind of sort of connecting the two. So I've got that blown up a little bit. So that's gonna be low pressure and it's a smaller radius than the other one. So I'm just gonna, again, trap that between my knees. Okay, I think that'll do. So I'm just gonna get that over the end. Okay, so if I just release these, we should find that they kind of equalize in size. which they kind of are, I think. It's not like last time where the small balloon got much smaller, um, but effectively this time, the two balloons, um, the, the lower pressure balloon with the smaller radius starts to increase in size and the larger diameter balloon actually gets a little bit smaller until again, both of them get to the same pressure and the same radius. And this is the kind of scenario that we had here. So this was low pressure, with a smaller radius than this one. And we can see how this one kind of sort of moves up the curve. And the, the green balloon, it started out with a larger radius at a higher pressure than this one. So it's going to sit over here. And again, that's kind of moved down here until they're both at the same pressure. Because they must be at the same pressure because they're connected up by a tube. Okay, hopefully that's a little bit to an explanation. Um, if I find that lots of people write some really good comments, I can obviously add that um, underneath the comments in the video. Um, and also I can add it to the actual downloadable work solutions for future people to see. So um, those were my work, my unofficial work solutions to the British Physics Olympiad questions. Um, I thought that these were challenging. Uh, as they should be, uh, but a lot of them actually just relied on the physics that you've been covering in A-level physics, or lots of stuff that you would have seen before when you did GCSE, and obviously uh, the skills that you've developed in your maths classes as well. So yeah, uh, thank you so much for watching. Um, do let me know uh, how your papers go, and uh, you know if you haven't already done so, make sure you do think about looking at other opportunities with the Olympiad. But I know by doing these kind of questions, it will make any kind of real exams that you have coming up a lot more straightforward and you'll be really, really well prepared for them. Thanks so much for watching. Goodbye.